Hey everybody, it's great to see you. My name's Simon. And whether you know that story really well, or are not familiar with most of the details, you've got to admit it's a heck of a story. Angels, pregnant teenager, an evil king, a rising star, and a cute baby. If you were going to pitch that to Hollywood, I reckon there'd be guaranteed success. You see, not only have you got a really good story in and of itself, You've got endless potential for sequels. The money will be rolling in for decades. And even the possibility of prequels as well. We like a good prequel, don't we? Everything is right there. We don't know many stories that are more than 2,000 years old. Some are passed down from, from generation to generation. But if we think about stories that are that old and that influential in our society, there are very few that have stood the test of time. But while all of us mark this story whenever we write the date, as a nation, we've left it behind. We don't really keep an eye on this story anymore. We don't really follow it. We don't really make it part of our lives. And actually, it doesn't really matter whether the story is true or not. Something nice for a children's nativity. Maybe once a year we can think about these little things, it doesn't really matter if these events happened or not. There are lots of things that we talk about at Christmas that aren't true. This is just one more. It's all part of the fun. Headley Park Primary School were in the building uh, this week doing their uh, Christmas show. It was always one of the highlights of the year. It was great to see the building full and uh, the platform cleared and all the children up here singing their hearts out. It was fantastic. And at various points, we heard about talking snowmen. We heard about turkeys who'd formed a union. And apparently, all Mariah Carey wants for Christmas is me, which was a bit of a surprise. (laughs) None of these stories are true. But if they help some people get into the Christmas spirit, then great. It can be fascinating, can't it, to talk about what other people do on Christmas Day. You see, for all of us, some of the basic ingredients are the same. There are presents, there's food, there's drink... There's the meat sweats, there's the good intentions for going for a walk and then ending up having a nap on the sofa. But we all have our unique way of doing things. If you say to someone, what are you doing on Christmas Day? You'd be like, oh yeah, we do that, or oh, not like that. Oh, that's something familiar. Oh no, I'm not sure about that. And actually, that's life generally. We have a story. We have the story of our life. And if some people want to make the original Christmas story, want to make the story that we've heard so far this evening part of their story, then great, fantastic, you knock yourself out. But it's not for me. But what if? What if this story, with all of its highs and lows, with all of its ordinary bits and its astonishing bits, is actually the biggest and most important story of all? What if this story is the story above and around all other stories? What if this is the story that makes sense of all the others? What if all the individual colors of our story find their home in the masterpiece of this story? What if the message of Christmas is not just part of some people's truth, but the one thing that we can trust to be universally true for all people at all times across all ages. What if we're wrong about Christmas and should make our story part of the story? Now, those of you who live in our community will have had A Christmas card from the church pushed through your door. They're actually in the back of the seats because we had a few spare. Massive thank you to all those who delivered. It's a big job to deliver 3,500 Christmas cards. But on the front was this message. Christmas brings hope. So maybe this whole thing is just pie-in-the-sky thinking. So I wonder how you would end that sentence. Christmas brings joy. Happiness, contentment, and peace. Christmas brings indigestion and a hangover. Christmas brings anticlimax, dissatisfaction, and debts to be paid off in January. 
Christmas brings sadness, grief, division, and pain. Christmas brings, how would you end that sentence? Many would say, yes, Christmas does bring hope, but it's regularly followed by disappointment. And that is a microcosm of life. Life on a grand scale is like that when it comes to Christmas. Life brings hope. We live in an amazing world with endless possibilities. We dream, we wonder, we hope. Yet often, it leads to disappointments. We don't end up where we thought we would. We don't end up doing what we thought we would be doing. We have our great stories, hope-filled stories. And yet we can't quite make them work out. Life brings disappointment. But what if? What if there is a bigger story and it brings everything? Let's go for a different story. The story of a man called Paul. Now, Paul was a a religious guy. He was really good at what he did. But he left it all behind to go and follow Jesus. He became a traveler, going around Eastern Europe, telling people about Jesus and starting churches all over the place. About 60 years after the birth of Jesus, he wrote a letter to a church in Rome. And we still have that letter. It's in our Bibles. And near the beginning, he writes these words about the story of Jesus. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And that, friends, is why what we've heard this evening is the biggest story of all, the one that is above and around all others. How does the Christmas story bring hope? Why do our stories need to be part of this bigger story? Because it brings salvation. Through this story, we are saved. Saved from ourselves, saved from the consequences of living in God's world as if he isn't there and doesn't care. See, Paul begins by saying that he is not ashamed. He's not ashamed of nailing his colours to the Jesus mast. And his life showed that even in the midst of suffering, in the midst of hardship, he unashamedly declared that he belonged to Jesus and he was going to live for him. You see, Paul wasn't ashamed because he knew two things about the story that we've heard this evening. He knew it was true and he knew that it worked. It was true and it worked. See, here at this church, we unashamedly say that whatever your story is, there is only a happily ever after found in Jesus. We would love to show you. We would love to show you how Jesus is the yes to all of our longings, all of our hopes, and all of our dreams. Now, that's a big statement to say that it's all about Jesus. But Paul goes on, for I am not ashamed of the gospel See, the word gospel, it just means good news. When the angels appeared to the shepherds and they said, we bring you good news, this is what they were talking about. Good news, the best news, he's here. The one that has been waiting for for centuries, he is here. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. Through him, God's power will be seen. You see, we live in a world where power and love and not often combined. We often see power wielded in an abusive way, in a dictatorial way where love is distant. Power is abused and the weak are exploited and injustice is seen. For those of you who don't know much about the life of Jesus, let me tell you that the way that it begins sets the tone for what is to come. The great God of heaven comes with all power, And he laid in a manger as a baby. That sets the tone for the one who with all authority in heaven and earth comes not to be served, but to serve. The one who made all things lying in a manger. The all-powerful one humbled himself so that he could come to serve. True power, real power, authentic power is used to serve. 
For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation. That's what he did with his power. You see, the story of Jesus is the big story of all reality. And so our stories need to be part of it. You see, the world was made with God and humanity on the same page. The all-powerful and all-loving God, compassionately, mercifully and lovingly writing our story for us. But we grabbed the pen from him, fired him from writing duties and took over writing our story ourselves. And that's unjust because this is God's world and he in his love sets the tone. It's enslaving because we aren't free to be the people that we were supposed to be. We can't be the best us without God's. And it's confusing because we search for happiness. We search for identity in all the wrong places. Not grasping that only in Jesus will we find the heart of who we are. And that's not a good place to be. But in love, Jesus came into this world to free those burdened by trying to live life on their own. To restore our fundamental identity as those made in the image of God. And to bring justice in a world where God is ignored and the vulnerable are exploited. We see him today as the baby in the manger. But he grew through his childhood, through his teenage years, his time working for his dad as a chippy, until he reached the age of 30. And he left it behind to show the ultimate act of love, the high point of the story as he brought salvation, as he came to save. Yet in a plot twist that few saw coming, the high point of this story, he did it by dying. See, the first Christmas has to be followed by the first Easter, when the Lord Jesus, now fully grown, was nailed to the cross, taking upon himself the shame and the penalty that we deserve for writing our stories without God's. Every strand in history, up to that point and beyond, all tied together in this act of love. It's through the cross that we are saved, that we know the salvation that is brought by God. Saved from the consequences of living in God's world as if he isn't there and doesn't care. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes to everyone who believes not to everyone to everyone who believes it is one heck of a story but then Jesus is one heck of a savior so the question is do you believe do you believe four stories on that video united by a phrase don't be afraid friends this Christmas don't be afraid Don't be afraid to push the boundaries of your own story and to see that at the edge of those boundaries is the story and that you can find your home within this greatest of stories. Don't be afraid of the change in your life that will come through following Jesus. It is the best news ever. It is drenched in love and is for your goods. And don't be afraid of lifting your eyes and seeing above the brokenness and the hardship of this world and seeing a saviour. You can't have Christmas without Christ. Don't write your story without him either. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we praise you for this story. We thank you that in love you gave your one and only Son, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you left the glory of heaven and you came. You laid aside your majesty. That you who made all things became helpless as a baby. Had to learn to walk, learn to talk. Were entirely dependent upon Mary and Joseph. And we thank you that in your love... 
in your devotion to your Father. You lived the life that we couldn't and died the death that we deserve. Father, we thank you for this great story. And we pray that we would find our own stories in the midst of it. That wherever we are, whatever our background, whatever our history, wherever we are right now, that we would know that there is a welcome from Jesus. That there is salvation. And that we can find the yes and the amen to all of our longings. Father, thank you that we need not be afraid. And I pray that this Christmas we would see Jesus and delight to call him our Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love for us. And in your name we pray. Amen.